My name's uh, Nicole Schultz, and I'm a librarian at the University of Michigan. I'm a librarian for geospatial and numeric data. Um, I'm going to be facilitating the lightning talk session this morning. I'm going to introduce each speaker before their presentation. Their presentation will be six to eight minutes long. Um, you can ask questions with the Zoom Q&A feature, and you can upvote others' questions. And I will be moderating the Q&A portion after we've heard from all of our presenters. Um, so use chat, please, for technical problems. And you've heard all the rest. So let's go ahead and get started. Our first presenter is Susan Reed. Um, Susan is a master's student showing, studying biology at Indiana University. She is excited to learn more about geospatial analysis and how its application in biology might support more informed conservation management decisions. She loves rock climbing and cycling in her free time. She is giving a talk today titled Range Shifts Predicted with Climate Change in a Common North American Songbird. And I will be sharing her slides and advancing them. And let me just confirm that you can see the slide, the intro slide without extra PowerPoint stuff around it. Is that correct? Looks good. <laughs> Great. All right. Take it away, Susan. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Susan Reed, and I'm a master's student at Indiana University studying biology. And I'm really interested in how populations and individuals respond to environmental change, most notably right now with climate change being a major threat to population persistence. Uh, slide. I don't know how that works. Yeah, cool. <laughs> um, if you all didn't know, birds are not doing very well right now. Since 1970, there's been a decline of 3 billion North American birds. 2.5 billion of them were native migratory birds. And birds pro provide many ecosystem services such as seed dispersal and pest maintenance. They are found all over our lives as cultural or religious symbols. And what I find most incredible about them is that they're really sensitive indicators of environmental health and environmental change. Lots of birds are really tiny and they are kind of at nature's will. And many of them perform many dramatic migratory movements across the year, sponging up multiple environments. And um, these declines in response to many, they're in response to many different things, such as habitat fragmentation, habitat loss, pollution is on the list, and an homage to our 3 billion canaries in the coal mine. I'll be digging into the effects of climate change today. Slide. Uh, species distribution models are becoming really popular tools for quantifying and visualizing range changes over time, even in future climate scenarios. They are models trained with known occurrences of a species to predict spatial and temporal patterns to predictor variables. And we can do slide one more time. There we go. Now that's a little bit of a mouthful, I guess, but looking at it like this might be a bit easier. If the red dots are birds or occurrence points of any species you're interested in, um, you overlay them on top of environmental conditions or rasters of things like temperature or precipitation, things that are important for the success of that organism. And you find a range of conditions that the species likes and can tolerate and you highlight in a different environment where those conditions occur again. And that is a map with a probability of occurrence. And so you can do this in future models as well. Slide. As an undergrad, I studied this cute small gray songbird called the dark-eyed junco. And it's found all across North America, breeding in the northern parts of Canada, lower parts of Alaska, and it's overwintering in the lower, lower 48. Although this bird isn't at risk of going extinct anytime soon, it provides a really great example um, for modeling birds, I guess, because it's really identifiable and really uh, abundant. So I'm hoping that this can help provide a framework for more at-risk at species 
And this is just a general note about myself, but this is my very first GIS project. I had never opened it before this project. So there's lots of things that could have been done more efficiently. And um, this is also a project that I use to better internalize species distribution models myself and how they work. So I'm replicating the most basic species distribution model, the bioclim model slide. And I'm hypothesizing that there will be northward grade shifts with climate change. Slide. These are some of the databases that I used. eBird is where I got my bird occurrence points. WorldClim is where my climate rasters came from. And I used ESRI's uh, ArcGIS Pro. Slide. Yeah, and the first thing I did was load a base map and I took a table with all of my occurrence points and plotted them using XY tabled points. And I just symbolized the breeding range birds, so the, the birds that occurred in the summer months with this orange color and blue was for the overwintering months. Slide. And I went to WorldClimb and downloaded 19 different bioclimatic uh, predictor variables as raster files. Slide. And they look kind of like this. They're, I think they're really pretty. <laughs> Slide. But they're also really big and really hard to manage. And even in ARC, I was struggling to stack them on top of one, each other, one another. So I moved them into ARC studio and um, I stacked them there and moved them back to ArcGIS Pro slide. Once I had my stacked rasters, I extracted multi values to table and exported that table to Excel slide. At which point I could create climate um, domains for each variable slide. And I could trim the raster of each climate predictor variable down to the range that the bird likes or occurs at. And so I have 19 of these different polygons slide, at which point you can overlay them in different combinations to find which combination best predicts the training data of the occurrence points. And this intersection is really, um, called the fundamental niche for that species. Slide. And after the intersection, I found a combination of about four variables that best predicted the training data. Here you can see the training data of um, the bird points, like the breeding occurrences over the breeding range. And so this is a predicted breeding range. The orange blob is the predicted range based off of the training data. And slide. I did the same thing for the non-breeding range. Slide. And I used that model of combinations of the training of the climate rasters to um, create a predicted breeding range. Slide. And non-breeding range as well. Slide. And when you put them all on top of each other, you can see that the predicted range is in red. The orange is, is the um, present day range. And the stable breeding range is the yellow blob in the middle. Slide. And I did the same thing for the non-breeding range. And this visualization really helps me see that there were actually northward shifts over time slide. And that then I calculated the area of each um, of each range and saw how they changed over time. Slide. And there was an increase in 21% for the breeding range, 6% for the non breeding range, 58% of the breeding range and 31% of the non breeding range are at risk of changing with climate change. Range expansion indicates that this species is likely not at risk of extinction with this climate scenario. And 
This also supported my hypothesis that there would be northward grade shifts with climate change. Slide. And hopefully in the future, I can use a more powerful model, something like maximum entropy with weighted regression for my predictor variables. And something like Maxent also handles sampling bias a bit better by inclusion of background points. And my dream is to hopefully include some more biologically relevant predictors, things like species interaction or food availability. And I believe that's everything I have. Thank you for your time. This is fun. <laughs> Thank you so much, Susan. I'm gonna switch my slides. Excuse me. And I'm going to introduce our next speaker, who is Damien Hamilek. Um, Damien is produce, pursuing a master's in civil engineering and a graduate GIS certificate at Purdue University as an online student. He has an undergraduate degree in civil engineering and a minor in management also from Purdue. Damien was introduced to GIS in his undergraduate studies and since then has enjoyed exploring the applications of GIS in his, well, sorry, I'm trying to manage my screens here, um, uh, in analyzing and assessing physical infrastructure. He currently works full-time as a construction business and litigation consultant at HKA in Chicago while pursuing his studies. Damien's talk is titled Estimating Urban Rooftop Solar Power Production Potential in Chicago, say that five times fast. So take it away, Damien. <laughs> Thanks, Nicole. Yeah, I, I was even uh, thinking about that title um, last night and what a mouthful it was. But yeah, essentially, it's um, the focus is just on estimating the amount of energy urban areas can produce from rooftop solar. Um, so imagining a ideal world where you were utilizing, you know, rooftop space as much as possible, um, or the type of buildings as much as possible, and not just letting them go to waste. Um, Basically, where I came up with this idea is, you know, from this little video that's playing on the intro slide is um, of this exact neighborhood that I was studying in Chicago. Um, and, you know, one day in the pandemic, a couple of years ago, I was in a high rise and looking over this, you know, sea of buildings um, and just see all these flat rooftops. And here or there, you might see a green roof, you might see some solar panels, you might see a patio, but the vast majority is, you know, virtually unutilized space, space which could be um, passively generating energy if not for some other you know, societal benefit of a park or outdoor area, whatnot, that might've been beneficial in the, in the pandemic. Um, but so um, the focus is primarily on a neighborhood called Lakeview and Nicole, if you could advance the next slide, please. Um, and so the, the focus of the area is actually Lakeview in Chicago, um, which is one of 77 neighborhoods in the entirety of the city. Uh, some stats on the neighborhood is that it's extremely dense, right? So in just this eight kilometer square area, there are nearly 15,000 buildings. And so that includes a variety of buildings. Um, and we'll get to that, that in a second. But um, the general number to kind of keep in mind here is that this specific neighborhood of about 100,000 people consumes around 630 or so gigawatt hours um, in a year, at least that's what they consumed in 2019. Next slide, please. And so just looking at the breakdown of this neighborhood, um, specifically the roof types, you can see that about 40% just by building count um, are flat roofs. So roofs that are less than 10 degrees in slope, 35% um, are gabled roofs. And then the remaining fourth is complex roofs, um, or what I would categorize as roofs that are you know, not flat, not gabled, um, might have a little bit more structure or a couple more angles in terms of like the slopes. Um, or they're already utilized for some other purpose, whether it be a green roof or a patio or their parking decks. And just a little bit more in terms of the building types that you might expect to see in this neighborhood specifically, um, there are a, almost a pretty majority, if not just over 50% of walk-ups or mixed use or single family homes, so very residential. 36% are garages, um, and so these are separated garages. And then the remaining are high rises, multi-unit, commercial buildings, or whatnot. Um, and then just on the right there, are just a couple simple examples of some of these buildings that um, you'd see in the neighborhood. 
And so top left is just a large apartment building. And then the bottom are what we typically call walk-ups. So the one in the bottom right, a very common building structure in this neighborhood where they're long and they're narrow. Um, this one specifically has a complex or, you know, a gabled roof. There's a lot of slope to it. Um, but just to get a kind of a basic sense of what does the physical infrastructure or what does the physical landscape look in this specific area. Next slide, please. And so looking at just some of these screenshots from ArcGIS Pro, which is the program that I used for analyzing the specific area from satellite imagery from the LIDAR, um, using those data sets, processing them into elevation rasters, and then from those rasters, you're able to figure out exactly which square meter or every single square meter of this area, um, the slope it has, the aspect, which just essentially means the direction that it faces, whether it's north, south, east, or west, um, or anything in between. And then finally, a solar radiation calculation that factors in all of those um, aspects as well into determining how much on an annual basis does a specific spot on the earth, and in, in this case, just on every portion of every roof, um, how much solar energy or radiation does it actually um, experience or does it get hit by in, in a year? So for the specific analysis, um, in order to determine what areas and what roofs were actually suitable, you got to figure out how large the rooftop is. So is it big enough to actually um, have an installed solar system? Um, how many solar panels could it fit, hypothetically? You also want to see if the rooftop is flat and sloped overall, um, how complex it is in terms of its overall steepness, its, you know, uh, what it looks like, co comprehension. comprehension. Um, the direction that all the roof faces, does an adequate amount of solar radiation even reach that roof given, you know, trees, given um, nearby structures? And then what is the intersection of all these conditions that actually make a specific spot suitable for a solar panel to be installed and actually cost effective? Next slide, please. And so looking at some of the results, this is just a histogram of the count of buildings by how I categorize suitable area sizes. So along the bottom, you can see three kilowatts all the way to 10 plus kilowatts. So a, for example, a six kilowatt system right there in the middle would need um, at a minimum 30.4 or 30 plus meters. And it, go, it can go up to a size of about 35 square meters. Um, and so you can see kind of that there are about 24% of the buildings are unsuitable already right off the bat. Um, but in terms of the number of buildings that are the most suitable are buildings that are in between the 50 to 100 square meter range and plus. Um, so the, it's important to see that up to, if not past 50 square meters, that's where kind of economies of scale can really um, make use of, you know, mass solar installation that kind of brings the cost down. Um, and that cons constitutes a sizable portion of about 42% of the total buildings. Next slide, please. And, you know, what got me going on this idea in the first place was just looking at how flat of all these roofs are, because there's this wide surface area of just this part of the city, if not for the rest of the city, um, that are just, it's completely um, unused. At least it's, you know, painted white such that it's more reflective and doesn't create as strong of a heat island, urban heat island effect. Um, but I feel like we can go a step further. So looking at just the distribution of slope, it's so clear that, um, you know, over 55% of the rooftop area is flat. That being, um, you know, is less than 10 degrees in slope. Um, and then another 0.7 kilometers squared out of the 2.7 kilometers squared of total rooftop area in the specific neighborhood um, is slope. So it's 15 to 45 degrees. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's suitable or it's facing the right direction, but that gives around 2.2 kilometers squared of total area to be considered for solar panel installations, at least in Lakeview, Chicago. Um, so, but the real big takeaway here is that over half of the area is a convenient flat surface, um, but not necessarily suitable or unsuitable yet. Next slide, please. So looking actually at the total suitable area um, in this, in Lakeview, we can see that um, this is just by square meter count um, that, you know, roofs that are greater than 50 kilometers or sorry, 50 meters squared, um, you know, have the overwhelming vast majority of the total suitable area. So, um, you know, if you see the nine, nine kilowatt system on the bottom, on the, on the X axis right there, everything greater than that 
constitutes about 85% of the total suitable area um, for buildings. So that is to say that, you know, there is potential for large solar installations um, and there's a lot of area that actually could be used as otherwise not doing anything um, for our purposes. Yeah. Next slide, please. And so um, here's kind of the big chart that we've all been waiting for in terms of understanding at least through my, my methodology using ArcGIS and using the tools inside there and my survey and whatnot. Um, not this is probably a pretty liberal um, estimation, but we see that um, the overwhelmingly large buildings um, make up a huge amount of the surface area not being used, have, the, have a huge amount of um, areas or roofs that are just sitting there completely flat um, and have the greatest potential for generating electricity. So the big number that I calculated was that about 295 gigawatt hours could be produced if we maximize the total installation potential of urban roofs um, in, in this part of area in Chicago, um, with just 28 coming from the smaller buildings. So it really just makes sense to focus on the um, more the, the large walk-ups, the, the large areas of commercial buildings, high rises, um, and apartment buildings that are you know, not being utilized by patios or other green spaces already, um, but that there is a great potential for um, electricity production in, in the city, um, just passively generating clean energy, especially with the fact that the return on investment for solar panels, um, which is, you know, even for Illinois or even Chicago, which is um, kind of, you know, not necessarily something you would expect considering that it's not necessarily a climate like Miami or, or um, California or whatnot, but it is reasonable in terms of creating an investment and in installing all these solar panels because there is a reasonable return on investment of about seven to 10-ish years um, if these panels are placed optimally, which on a rooftop can be angled in any direction you want. Next slide, please. And so just a quick comparison of other studies that I um, referenced against. So ArcGIS Pro, that's the calculations that I created. Um, comparing that to CMAP, which is the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning and NREL, which is the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Um, my numbers are a lot higher. So definitely my methodology um, maybe is a little bit more liberal in that it's not factoring things like actual zoning policy um, or any restrictions that the city might have in terms of buildings. It's not factoring in terms of the actual structural capacity of every single building. Um, but we can see that um, it, between CMEP and REL, they're pretty similar in terms of just understanding what overall in Chicago could be potentially installed to meet the actual consumption or the actual demand of electricity per year. Um, but I don't think it belabors the point or, or beats the point that, you know, there is a huge potential for making use of the suitable areas on rooftops that are just, you know, as we speak, not basically be, not being used for anything. Um, Without that, without being said, you know, it won't consume everything or won't cover the entire consumption that's needed, but um, it does do a fair chunk. Next slide, please. And so some of the ways that I contemplate on expanding my project, including incorporating data for the entirety of Chicago, um, would definitely love to see that and compare that in terms of other studies that I've looked at the entirety of Chicago. However, my small laptop um, doesn't exactly have the processing power to do that really quickly it would take a couple of days. Um, but I would also look into having a stronger methodology for filtering roofs or doing surveys in terms of understanding the exact com composition of the um, rooftop area or the roofs or the buildings or whatnot, and also expanding this to other buildings uh, or other cities as well that don't necessarily have such flat rooftops um, as Chicago. But thank you, Nicole. Thanks for everyone for listening to my presentation. All right. Thank you so much, Damian. All right, our next presenter is um, Amanda Tickner. And Amanda has a PhD in anthropology and an MLIS from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. She is currently a GIS librarian at Michigan State University. Her talk today is titled Developing a Predictive Cultural Heritage Model of Michigan. Thank you, Amanda. Hello. Um... Yep, uh, you can jump to the next slide right away here. I'm gonna try and go fast. So um, this presentation is a um, very, very quick summary of a grant project that I've worked on for several years now. The funding agency is the Natural Resor uh, Resource Conservation Service of Michigan, um, which is part of the United States Department of Agriculture. 
uh, and um, the project goal was to create a predictive model of cultural heritage remains to for use in the field um, and also to provide information to stakeholders. Um, and by cultural heritage, I mean archaeological remains, uh, primarily of Native Americans. Um, next slide, please. One of the, oh, right. right. So there's a lot of people uh, involved in this project. Um, the big four would be myself, Jubin, uh, Katie, and Ben on the top there. And I also want to give a special shout out. I'll mention them again. I'm um, S-U-R-S-G-I-S, helped us out a great deal. Um, next slide, please. So one of the components of this model that we wanted to include, but did not wind up being able to include was community mapping. Um, there have been sort of a lot of predictive models of this type uh, before, but one of the things that was going to make ours unique was to add the component of speaking to members of tribes and getting their input on what is currently important to them. So incorporating current uh, places of importance as well as the historical and the archaeological record. Um, and we planned QGIS workshops, um, which would allow for community mapping to happen. Uh, this didn't happen. Um, I think if I had this to do, I think, if well, I know if I had this to do over again, um, we would have incorporated um, partnership and input with the tribes before we even started the grant. So with the grant writing portion, um, rather than sort of trying to incorporate it after the fact. Um, and also COVID was a real derailment. Um, people were just at capacity and couldn't engage with any other, you know, projects during that time. So we weren't able to do this, uh, unfortunately. Um, next slide. Uh, so what were we able to incorporate? Well, uh, historic maps was the primary component that we were able to incorporate. Um, we visited archives, we selected useful historic maps, most of them are rejected. Um, which I'll talk about, but well, the ones we finally picked were sort of aggregate of historic materials rather than the actual historic maps. Um, we georeferenced those maps, we digitized features, we did quality control, and we sort of removed redundancies between the two map data sets that we came up with. Um, so that was our process for that. Obvious question, why didn't we use actual archaeological data? we kind of did by proxy, which I'll talk about in a second, but mostly because the State Historic Preservation Office did not have the records digitized at that point and also did not want us to use them, um, politics. So um, hopefully in the future, those, we'll, I'll talk about that at the end, but yeah, so that's why we went to maps first. Next slide, please. So one of the uh, maps that we used was, um, JWL Trig, uh, Summary of Surveyor's Notes. So when Michigan was initially surveyed, surveyors took very detailed notes. Those include, included things about indigenous um, activities at the time. So roads, fields, um, sugar camps and so forth. Uh, and so we digitized all of that uh, and used that as one of our primary data sets. Next slide, please. We also used an archaeological atlas of Michigan uh, by Hinsdale. This is a very famous uh, atlas in Michigan archaeological circles. Uh, maybe not globally, but everyone knows Hinsdale in Michigan, works in archaeology. Uh, and so we digitized that uh, as well. Um, and this was published in 1931. So obviously the more recent discoveries weren't included, but it was pretty comprehensive. Uh, we wound it up sort of uh, a lot of the features on this included um, things like Native American reservations, and uh, those ended up being two large of polygons. Um, we were working towards a model that would be applicable on the township level, but some of these polygons were awfully big and were kind of messing up the model, so we ended up throwing them out. But there's still a lot of stuff we pulled from this one. Next slide, please. So those were our two historic data sets. Um, most of the other historic maps we found were just not um, not detailed enough uh, and not accurate enough uh, to be valuable and for use in a model like this. Uh, then we also included digital elevation data and hydrology, um, and I believe some information about soils. Uh, we also added that in. So 
that was one component. Um, next slide, please. So basically to create this model, we looked at a historic framework, uh, we provided, collected that historic data from maps, uh, looked at sort of behavioral framework, which is the environmental data. People aren't going to have camps or do activities on a cliff, right? So digital elevation is really important in creating these kinds of models. Um, people also aren't gonna do a lot in the middle of the lake. Uh, so again, that's, that's uh, those sort of environmental things that constrain behavior are really important. Then uh, we employed a boot sampling, bootstrapping sampling approach to determine the probability of matching kind of the, the historic and the environmental data together to identify uh, places, uh, create basically a surface that would predict where uh, archeological remains might be found. Next slide, please. So it was a decision tree type model. You basically have different um, data sets. You kind of do yes, no with them to create trees and then your data set gets smaller. And eventually you have a surface. Next slide, please. I am oversimplifying a great deal there, but we're gonna roll with it. I will say that I did not actually run that model. RSGIS, this is where I get to do the shout out for RSGIS, uh, it was a, a company that we contracted out with um, and they did a great job, super helpful really expensive. <laughs> so I recommend them if you have a project like this and need to contract out. Um, this was our final raster surface uh, and it was presented to Michigan Archaeology um, Society and they were quite impressed with it. Actually, it seemed to jive with their understandings of what was going on on the ground. And also um, most of our sort of values that we would use to evaluate whether or not this was successful statistically um, came back as being within the realm of reasonable. Uh, so the Gini values and all of that came back as being okay. Um, all of which honestly surprised me. Uh, I wasn't expecting this to turn out super well and it apparently it seems to be reasonable. Um, so that was great. I was super surprised. Next slide, please. Um, in the future, we could iterate on this model by including the community mapping data. We could also one of the actual advantages, at first I was very disappointed that we weren't gonna be able to use the sort of more modern archeological data from the SHPO, but ultimately I think it, it provides an interesting opportunity if that data becomes available because then that data could conceivably test our model, essentially like, does this model match what it was actually found um, in the SHPO's records? Uh, so that those are kind of some future directions. Thank you very much for having uh, me talk here. And uh, yeah, that's it.